brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that supports life and family. 5% of your monthly plan price goes to your favorite charity. Mention offer code TRADITION for a special Christmas offer. Learn more at CharityMobile.com. I do believe it's fitting to end 2023 in this year or year and a half long examination of St. Vincent of Laren's incredible work, the combinatory, to finish the work at the end of 2023 before going on to some other similar examination by another great mind of the church. St. Vincent of Laren's is a doctor of the church, and I decided to bring this text to the audience of this channel because Francis and all of his infinite mercy has been misappropriating St. Vincent of Laren's to justify his revolution in the church. See, St. Vincent of Laren's stood against the concept of novelties and the idea that you can change doctrine and impose new traditions on the church. And yet, Francis has tried to use St. Vincent of Laren's to justify such things. And so what better person to repudiate and refute the things that Francis does than a great doctor of the church, one who would be otherwise forgotten in the minds of most interested laity, if it weren't ironically for Francis himself continuing to insist on invoking this doctor of the church in defense of the errors he promotes. So let's finish this book together, folks. This is going to be an interesting read because he is going to be summarizing everything he says here and giving you the implications of what his entire work has been about. I do recommend getting a physical copy of the Combinatory if you can. It's a 15, 1600 year old book that has been translated and retranslated and is still widely available for multiple publishers as well as probably for free online. Chapter 29, Recapitulation. This being the case, it is now time that we should recapitulate at the close of this second combinatory what was said in that and in the preceding. We said above that it has always been the custom of Catholics, and still is, to prove the true faith in these two ways, first by the authority of the divine canon, and next by the tradition of the Catholic Church. Not that the canon alone does not of itself suffice for every question, but seeing that the more parts interpreting the divine words according to their own persuasion take up various erroneous opinions, it is therefore necessary that the interpretation of divine scripture should be ruled according to the one standard of the church's belief, especially in those articles on which the foundations of all Catholic doctrine rest. We said likewise that in the church itself, regard must be had to the consentient voice of universality, equally with that of antiquity, lest we either be torn from the integrity of unity and carried away to schism, or be precipitated from the religion of antiquity into heretical novelties. We said further that in this same ecclesiastical antiquity, two points are very carefully and earnestly to be held in view by those who would keep clear of heresy. First, they should ascertain whether any decision has been given in ancient times as to the matter in question by the whole priesthood of the Catholic Church, with the authority of the general council. And secondly, if some new question should arise on which no such decision has been given, they should then have recourse to the opinions of the Holy Fathers, of those at least who, each in his own time and place, remaining in the unity of communion and of the faith, were accepted as approved masters. And whatsoever these may be found to have held, with one mind and with one consent, this ought to have been accounted the true and Catholic doctrine of the Church, without any doubt or scruple. Which, lest we should seem to allege presumptuously on our own warrant, rather than on the authority of the Church, we appeal to the example of the Holy Council, which some three years ago was held at Ephesus in Asia, in the consulship of Bassus and Antiochus, where, when questions were raised as to the authoritative determining of the rules of faith, lest perchance any profane novelty should creep in, as did in the twisting of the truth at Arminium, the whole body of priests there assembled, nearly two hundred in number, approved of this as the most Catholic, the most trustworthy, and the best source, vis-a-vis -vis to bring forth into the midst the sentiments of the Holy Fathers, some of whom it was well known had been martyrs, some confessors, but all had been, and continued to the end to be, Catholic priests, in order that by their consentient determination the reverence due to ancient truth might be duly and solemnly confirmed, and the blasphemy of profane novelty condemned, which having been done, the impious Nestorius was lawfully and deservedly adjudged to be opposed to Catholic antiquity, and contrarywise blessed Cyril to be in agreement with it, and that nothing might be wanting to the credibility of the matter, we recorded the names and the number, though we had forgotten the order, of the fathers, 
according to whose consentient and unanimous judgment, both the sacred preliminaries of judicial procedure were expounded and the rule of divine truth established. Whom that we may strengthen our memory, it will also it will be no superfluous labor to mention again here also. Chapter 30. Council of Ephesus. These then are the men whose writings, whether as judges or as witnesses, were recited in the council. St. Peter, Bishop of Alexandria, a most excellent doctor, a most blessed martyr. St. Athanasius, Bishop of the same city, a most faithful teacher and most eminent confessor. St. Theophilus, also Bishop of the same city, a man illustrious for his faith, his life, his knowledge, whose successor, the revered Cyril, now adorns the Alexandrian church. And lest perchance the doctrine ratified by the council should be thought peculiar to one city and province, there were added also those lights of Cappadocia, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, bishop and confessor, St. Basil of Caesarea in Cappadocia, bishop and confessor, and the other St. Gregory, St. Gregory of Nyssa, for his faith, his conversation, his integrity, and his wisdom most worthy to be the brother of Basil. And like Greece or the East should be seen to stand alone, to prove that the Western and Latin would also have always held the same belief, there we read in the council certain epistles of St. Felix, martyr, and St. Julius, both bishop of Rome, and that not only the head but the other parts of the world also might bear witness to the judgment of the council, there was added from the south the most blooded Cyprian, bishop of Carthage and martyr, from the north St. Ambrose, bishop of Milan. These all then, to the sacred number of the Decalogue, were produced at Ephesus as doctors, counselors, witnesses, judges. And that blessed council, holding their doctrine, following their counsel, believing their witnesses, submitted to their judgment without haste, without having foregone conclusion, without partiality, gave their determination concerning the rules of faith. A much greater number of the ancients might have been adduced, but it was needless because neither was it fit for the that the time should be occupied by a multitude of witnesses, nor does any one suppose that those ten were really of a different mind from the rest of their colleagues. Chapter 31. The Constancy of the Ephesine Fathers in Driving Away Novelty and Maintaining Antiquity. After the proceeding, we added also the sentence of Blessed Cyril, which is contained in these same ecclesiastical proceedings. For when the epistle of Caprolius, bishop of Carthage, had been read, wherein he earnestly entreats that novelty may be driven away and antiquity maintained, Cyril made and carried the proposal, which it may not be out of place to insert here. For, says he, at the close of the proceedings, let the epistle of Caprolius also, the reverend and very religious bishop of Carthage, which has been read, be inserted in the Acts. His mind is obvious, for he entreats that the doctrines of the ancient faith be confirmed, such as are novel, wantonly devised, and impiously promulgated, reprobated, and condemned. All the bishops cried out, These are the words of all. This we all say, this we all desire. What mean the words of all, what mean the desires of all, but that what has been handed down from antiquity should be retained, what has been newly devised, rejected with disdain. Next, we expressed our admiration of the humility and sanctity of that council, such that, though the number of priests were so great, almost the most part of them metropolitans, so erudite, we learned that almost all were capable of taking part in doctrinal discussions, whom in the very circumstance of their being assembled for the purpose, might seem to be emboldened to make some determination on their own authority. Yet they innovated nothing, presumed nothing, arrogated to themselves absolutely nothing, but used all possible care to hand down nothing to posterity but what they had themselves received from their fathers. And not only did they dispose satisfactorily of the matter presently in hand, but they also set an example to those who should come after them, how they should also adhere to the de determinations of sacred antiquity and condemn the devices of profane novelty. We invade also against the wicked presumption of Nestorius in boasting that he was the first and the only one who understood Holy Scripture, and that all those teachers were ignorant, who before him had expounded the sacred oracles, forsooth, the whole body of priests, the whole body of confessors and martyrs, and of whom some had published commentaries upon the law of God. Others had agreed with them in their comments or had acquiesced in them. In a word, he confidently asserted that the whole church was even now in error, and always had been in error, in that, as it seemed to him, it had followed, and it was following, ignorant and misguided teachers. Chapter 32. The Zeal of Celestine and Sixtus, Bishops of Rome in Opposing Novelty. The foregoing would be enough and very much more than enough to crush and annihilate every profane novelty. But yet that nothing might be wanting to such completeness of proof, we added, at the close, the twofold authority of the apostolic see. First that of the holy Pope Sixtus, the venerable prelate who now adorns the Roman church, and secondly that of his predecessor, Pope Celestine of blessed memory, which same we think is necessary to insert here also. 
Holy Pope Sixtus then says in an epistle which he wrote on Historius' matter to the Bishop of Antioch, Therefore, because as the Apostle says, the faith is one, evidently the faith which has obtained hitherto, let us believe the things that are to be said and say the things that are to be held. What are the things that are to be believed and to be said? He goes on, Let no license be allowed to novelty, because it is not fit that any addition should be made to antiquity. Let not the clear faith and belief of our fathers be fouled by any muddy admixture. A truly apostolic sentiment. He enhances the beliefs of the fathers by the epithet of clearness, profane novelties he calls muddy. Holy Pope Celestine also expresses himself in like manner to the same effect. For in the epistle which he wrote to the priests of Gaul, charging them with connivance with error, in that by their silence they failed in their duty to the ancient faith and allowed profane novelties to spring up, he says, We are deservedly to blame if we encourage error by silence. Therefore rebuke these people, restrain their liberty of preaching. But here someone may doubt who they are, whose liberty to preach as they, listy forbids. The preachers of antiquity are the divisors of novelty. Let himself tell us, let himself resolve to the reader's doubt. For he goes on, the case be so, that is, if the case be so certain as persons complain to me touching your cities and provinces, that by your hurtful dissimulation you cause them to consent to certain novelties. If the case be so, let novelty cease to assail antiquity. This then was the sentence of Blessed Celestine, not the antiquity should cease to subvert novelty, but that novelty should cease to assail antiquity. Chapter 33. The children of the Catholic Church ought to adhere to the faith of their fathers and give everything for it. Whoever then gainsays these apostolic and Catholic determinations, first of all, necessarily insults the memory of Holy Celestine, who decreed that novelty should cease to assail antiquity, and in the next place sets at naught the decision of Holy Sixtus, whose sentence was, let no license be allowed to novelty, since it is not fit that any addition be made to antiquity. Moreover, he condemns the determination of Blessed Cyril, who extolled with high praise the zeal of the venerable Caprolius, in that he would fain have the ancient doctrines of the faith confirmed, the novel inventions condemned. Yet more he tramples upon the Council of Ephesus, that is on the decisions of the holy bishops of almost the whole East, who decried under divine guidance that nothing ought to be believed by posterity save what the sacred antiquity of the Holy Fathers, consentient in Christ, had held, who with one voice and with loud acclaim testified that these were the words of all. This was the wish of all. This was the sentence of all. That is, almost all heretics before Nestorius, despising antiquity and upholding novelty, had been condemned. So Nestorius, the author, the author of novelty and the assailant of antiquity, should be condemned also, whose consentient determination, inspired by the gift of sacred and celestial grace, Whoever disapproves must needs hold the profaneness of Nestorius to have been condemned unjustly. Finally, he despises as vile and worthless the whole Church of Christ, and as doctors, apostles, prophets, and especially the blessed Apostle Paul. He despises the Church, in that he, she hath never failed in loyalty to the duty of cherishing and preserving the faith once for all delivered to her. He despises St. Paul, who wrote, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to thee, shunning profane novelties of words. And again, if any man preach unto you, other than ye have received, let him be accursed. But if neither apostolic injunctions nor ecclesiastical decrees may be violated, by which in accordance with the sacred consent of universality and antiquity, all heretics always, and last of all Pelagius, Celestius, and Nestorius, have been rightly and deservedly condemned, then assuredly it is incumbent on all Catholics who are anxious to appear to prove themselves genuine sons of Mother Church to adhere henceforward to the holy faith of the Holy Fathers, to be wedded to it, to die in it, but as to the profane novelties of profane men, to detest them, abhor them, oppose them, give them no quarter. These matters handled more at large of the two preceding combinatories, I have now put together more briefly by way of recapitulation, in order that my memory, to aid what, to which I compose them, may on the one hand be refreshed by frequent reference, and on the other may avoid being wearied by prolix city. And that was the close of the combinatory. Your instructions from the doctor of the church is to resist and object to all novelties in the faith. Two, if need be, give everything to resist novelties in the faith. Pretty straightforward to me. This book reads like the guidestone or manual to the recognize and resist movements, if you want my brutally honest opinion. He told us, straightforward, to resist novelties and cling to antiquity. What do you make of this? Well, let me know your thoughts on this work in the comments, please. You can find a copy of the Combinatory 
anywhere really on Amazon or any Catholic bookseller online will have copies of this book. It is that important. And it's still in print to this day. I know, I checked. But let me know what you thought about this in the comments, please, and hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So to sharing this on social media, that helps a lot too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.